Today we have an honor to have what I believe is one of the greatest contributors to the game of basketball and the history of the game of basketball. He's a person who brings a unique philosophy to the to this interview because he was he played the game, he coached the game, he taught the game, and he analyzes the game from a broadcast standpoint. And so clearly he has a, a, a complete perspective of the game. His coaching career spans well over five generations of basketball. So he's seen the evolution of the game from its very uh, uh, start uh, and the professional ranks on through to today. And that's the great, and the, everyone who I've ever talked to agrees on this, the greatest basketball clinician in the history of the game, UB Brown. You're very kind, George. <laughs> it's, it's, it's only the truth. I only speak the truth. You, I, I was fascinated to find out that you grew up, uh, you're, at least you were born in Hazleton, Pennsylvania, and then I guess around three or four years old, your family moved to Elizabeth, New Jersey, and you grew up there and, and, and uh, went to uh, St. Mary's uh, High School there. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about what the, the early years for UB Brown were as, as a family. What did your dad do? What did your mom do? Did you have any brothers and sisters? No brothers and sisters. Uh, my family moved when you said when we were three years old from Hazleton. Uh, basically, my mother and father's family were coal mining people. Mm -hmm. uh, when we moved to Elizabeth, my dad went to work for the Kearney Shipyards building battleships and destroyers and he was a foreman there for 19 years when the wars ended uh, the second world war ended they released and closed the Kearney ship so that put my dad in a difficult position uh, he went to work for singers in elizabeth which was singers manufacturing company so everything was okay well i'll be after about three months they reopened the Kearney shipyards and they bring back all the foremen. So they go back, and within two months they close. Mm. So now there were no jobs. And uh, for us, this was an extremely difficult time for our family. And because, as you know, Elizabeth, New Jersey at that time was 150,000 people, seven high schools, six of which were playing boys' sports. And uh, this city was predom predominantly a Catholic city in regards to religion. So they had 14 grammar schools in Elizabeth uh, belonging to Catholic schools that played basketball and baseball. So you knew as you were a kid coming through this uh, that you were going to uh, play two sports for sure. Uh, my dad, unfortunately, uh, could not get a job and then he became the custodian at St. Mary's High School during my four years in school. And this had a big bearing on me uh, because he was able to keep tabs on you. Uh, our neighborhood was like most neighborhoods at that time. Uh, you know, nobody had a car, nobody had a phone or television or anything like that. And so basically you were involved in sports. So I was able to, in high school, play for one of the greatest coaches, I think, and one of the greatest basketball clinicians of all time, Al Lababo. and. In my senior year, we won the state football championship and then went undefeated and won the city, county, and state basketball championship. And baseball, we were good. We won the state championship in my, my freshman year. So I was always in this sports environment. Even though we were a small Catholic school, we were playing everyone because back then there were not leagues. We didn't have leagues back then. Mm -hmm. So even though you were a small Catholic school, you were playing in New Jersey, the biggest schools, group four schools. And mm -hmm. so it, it meant for great competition. And because of his legendary status as a coach, he affected a lot of us. And then all of a sudden, in my senior year, we're going to college on basketball scholarships. And that changed the environment in our neighborhood funneling into St. Mary's High School. You could now go to school, play basketball, and then get, get a, a basketball scholarship. scholarship. Yeah. I mean, whoever thought of right. that? I mean, most of all, 
in our families who ever went to college. Yes, I mean, you know, we were the first mind. ones that were going to college. Mm -hmm. You know, who were your sports heroes when you were growing up in high school? Who were the, who were the, the athletes that you tried to emulate? Well, as you know, Judge, television never came in until we were in our junior year in uh, high school. And then they came out, those little seven-inch boxes mm -hmm. that came out. Uh, I was brought up to be a baseball player. And I think anyone my age, that was your goal. Your goal was to play on any of the eight teams in the American League or eight teams in the National League. There were only 16 teams. So for recreation, my dad brought me up on the Yankees and the Giants. Every Sunday we'd go to Mass at 9 a.m., come home, have breakfast. My mother would have lunches packed. We'd walk downtown, take the train into New York, take the subways either to the polo grounds or to the Yankee stadiums. Now for me, I idolized Bill Dickey because I was a catcher and Bill Dickey was the catcher for the Yankees and one of the greatest ever to play. Now DiMaggio was playing at that time and they had great teams. And then in the Giants, I love Mel Ott. Mel Ott was a, a right fielder who picked up his leg. He's a left-handed hitter. And uh, the Giants were great. Now I realize the Dodgers were great at that time also, but if you were a Giant or a, a Yankee fan, you hated the Dodgers. So, <laughs> I, I, yeah. Yeah. But uh, to me, uh, my heroes really were in professionally baseball people. But in my neighborhood, uh, the guy that I respected the most just passed away uh, two weeks ago, a guy by the name of Jimmy Murphy. He was four years ahead of us, and he was this great basketball player, just great. And went on and eventually played at Rhode Island, became a lawyer and then a judge and uh, owned the, the best restaurant ever in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And, and he just passed away. But they were the kind of guys who were our heroes. Because as you remember, George, when we grew up, after you came home from practice and you ate supper, you'd go up to the corner and you hung out on the corner. Yes. And, you know, the, the varsity guys could stand on one corner and then the grammar school guys could stand on the other. And then the gang that controlled the neighborhood, they were on the other corner. Mm -hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. And in our area, it was called the sparklers mm -hmm. and they protected everything that was going on. So it was, uh, you know, a diff different way of growing up at that time. You'd be, you, you, you've not only been an, a, a great coach, but a great teacher, too. And it would almost make me suspect that somewhere in early on in, in junior high and high school, uh, you had some special teachers, special mentors and coaches that helped mold you uh, and, 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 and give you examples of what good teachers are and how they go about achieving that. Besides Al Ababo, or even with Al Ababo, who are some of the people that influenced you in, in that area, Yubi? Well, you and I could spend two hours just talking about the Five Star Camp. Yes. And anybody out there who was the best teaching camp in the United States, when it first started out, there were only 80-some kids in the first camp. They were basically all from New York, New Jersey, and uh, the Long Island area, and Connecticut. Then the camp just exploded when everyone mm -hmm. saw the talent that mm -hmm. was there that mm -hmm. first year. And uh, <clears throat> that camp developed. When you came in as a high school coach to that camp, and you were influenced by all of the different guys that were coaching in that big metropolitan area. Then when the camp exploded to a week in August and a week in June, then we were getting guys from the Philadelphia, the Boston, the Washington DC teams, mm -hmm. the Matha, and in St. Anthony's with uh, John Thompson mm -hmm. and Morgan Wooten, and, and then Eastern High School. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when the Detroit guys came. When Isaiah Thomas brought uh, the group of guys from Chicago, all of a sudden now the camp is spreading and it brought all kinds of ideas of how the game should be played. So when people talk about the five-star camp, they all talk about the stations. The stations were created by Bobby Knight. Mm -hmm. Bobby Knight's the one that created those stations. Because the first year Roy Rubin ran the camp, they played three games a day, 
and a lecture, and there was none of this teaching. Uh, Roy Rubin then went on to coach from LIU University, the uh, uh, Philadelphia 76ers, and he was replaced running that camp by Bobby Knight, who came in year two. And when Bobby came down from West Point, he put in the stations and the ideas at each station. Well, when you open up where these coaches are coming from and these players are coming from, different ideas came. So it, would, it might not happen at the stations that you saw other guys, but it would happen in the games that were being coached. And then later on at 11 o'clock when we all went down to the Fireside Restaurant, there was more basketball taught in that restaurant than probably any place in the country mm -hmm. because you were a major part of that yourself mm -hmm. and you know there would be fistfights at the bar mm -hmm. or at the pool tables over philosophy of how to guard yeah. or stand. Yes. Okay? Yeah. So to me, Al Ababo is still the, the guy for me that gave me the defensive philosophies. But when I went through the high school and college coaching and Larry Costello with the Milwaukee Bucks who brought me in as an assistant opened up my mind offensively to incredible ideas and just like for Kareem Abdul-Jabbar George we, we had 11 different sets just for Kareem <laughs> to run different plays for yeah, him. Yes. Now, like today, kids couldn't even remember five different sets. Yeah. We had 11 different things just for Kareem. Never mind Oscar Robertson, yes, okay? Yes. Or Bobby Dandridge, yes. all right? It was a mind-blowing experience. Now, people always say to me, on television, you're short, you're to the point, and stuff. Well, I got that from that five-star camp and then going out and doing clinics learning how to be brief because your attention span and then to give you things to remind you what to associate with whatever you're teaching so that it comes back to you that you remember things and it, it's all a matter of giving credit to a host of people that have come into your life that touch you and then you see what they're doing and then you incorporate not everything but what can go easily into what you believe in and then it becomes down to can you communicate short sentences be brief to keep the people whether it's a clinic involved whether it's a camp talking to players his attention span and then on television that same thing keeping it brief to the point and showing them because they see the picture but do they really see what's going on mm -hmm.